recording and pass it off to you, Sue. Hi, greetings. Welcome to uh, Darby Creek Watershed 101. Um, this is a collaboration between Darby Creek Valley Association, Willistown Conservancy Trust, and Stroud Water Research Center. Um, today, we have Dr. and Catherine Goddard Domes uh, talking about the fish of the Darby Creek. And I will introduce you in a second, Kate, and let you share your screen. First, I want to go over a couple of the housekeeping things. Uh, one of the things is we will um, be asked to have a time at the end of our uh, presentation in order for Q&A. Meanwhile, if you want, do have a question and want to type it into chat, you can do that. Otherwise, you can just wait to the end and you can either type it into chat or if it's a conversation you want to have, we can open up and let you actually ask the questions and have a conversation. And with that, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Catherine goddard Dones. Uh, she is a professor at your sinus college and she will be talking about the fish of the Darby Creek watershed and some very interesting facts about them. So Kate, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and you can start sharing. Good morning, everybody. So can everyone see my, my screen now? Great. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about the fishes of the Darby Creek watershed. First of all, I'd like to show this Google Earth picture that orients us on the Earth as to where the Darby Creek watershed is. As you can see, we have New Jersey on the right and the Delaware River dividing New Jersey and Pennsylvania and the Darby Creek watershed right there in the center of the screen. You can see a little white line right underneath the arrow that indicates the Darby Creek watershed. And that white line is Route 202 if you want to get some perspective. The watershed to the west of us, immediately to the west of us, is the Susquehanna River watershed that leads into the Chesapeake Bay. As you can see, the Darby Creek, because it empties into the Delaware River, which empties into the Delaware Bay, is very close to the coast, and that has a, an effect on the variety of fish that we find in our watershed. The Darby Creek watershed begins in the Piedmont, which is the foothills of the Appalachians, and runs southeast onto the coastal plain to the Delaware River. The Delaware River and the Delaware Bay, the mouths of the tributaries, and the marshes are all considered an estuary. Estuaries are areas where freshwater environments meet the marine environment. The fall line is an interesting concept about which many people do not know. And if you look at the picture on the right from Wikipedia, you'll see the fall line is where the color change occurs. The fall line is where the purple and uh, gold and green give way to the, the grays on the right. That is the drop in elevation between the hard rocks of the Piedmont and the soft unconsolidated sediments of the coastal plain. As you can see, it runs along the east coast of the United States, and fall lines are found elsewhere in the world as well. The drop can be abrupt and evidenced by waterfalls, or it can be more gradual. Hundreds and hundreds of dams were built in the mid-Atlantic region in past centuries on the fall line. They were built to power grist mills, sawmills, and manufacturing. The dams are very detrimental to migratory fishes, as we'll discuss in a moment. A little further orientation about the Darby Creek watershed. The headwaters of the Darby Creek are in Treddyfrin, Easttown, Radnor, and Lower Marion Townships, and these are all in the Piedmont. The confluence of the Darby Creek with the Delaware River is in the coastal plain at the bottom of the bottom right of the screen. Thus, the inclusion of strictly freshwater habitats at the top of the watershed and estuarine habitats at the bottom of the watershed accommodates a variety of fish communities. 
the last remaining tidal freshwater marsh in Pennsylvania is in the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge. And this is at the, a very important part of the bottom of the Darby Creek watershed. Darby Creek enters the Delaware River just a little downstream from the John Hines Refuge. And it is truly a tidal area. The ocean pushes the bay, the high tide pushes the, of the ocean pushes the bay, the bay pushes the river, and the river pushes the tributaries. When I've gone uh, sampling with my students in the Muckinapetus Creek, which is very close to the Hines Refuge, one of the things I ask them to do is to measure the water flow. And they are sometimes surprised to see that the stream is either standing still or even running backwards because it's being pushed up by the tide. Susan asked me to talk about the diversity of fish in the Darby Creek watershed. And I did a lot of research and I found that the list is rather long. So rather than list every single fish that we, uh, type of fish that we have in the watershed, I, I picked out some general categories to mention. So if you look on the left, we have freshwater fishes, we have estuarine fishes, and we have diadromous fishes. And we'll talk about what diadromous means in the next slide. These, those are migratory fish. So going back over to the left, the freshwater fishes include minnows, shiners, and dace. And they're all in the same family. And they're relative the common carp, which is an introduced species. We also have sunfishes and basses, catfish, Three spined stickleback has been reported in the watershed. This is a, a very small fish whose behavior has been extensively studied, has three spines on its back. Um, it's only about an inch and a half long. We also have suckers, yellow perch, bowfin, snakehead, which is not only an introduced species, but an invasive species. And it's also been reported that we have brown trout which are non-native in the upper watershed. The um, fish that you see pictured at the bottom left is the black-nosed dace. And this is one of the very, very common fish in the watershed. They love to hide under rocks, which makes them really difficult to catch. These are, are pretty little fish. They're about an inch and a half long. The included in the estuarine fish are the spot, which you see pictured in the middle column. So these are fishes that are found in brackish waters, waters that are partially fresh and partially salt. Hog choker has also been reported in the watershed. Hog choker is a small fat, pardon me, a, a small flat fish. Mummy chogs, which we'll talk about a bit later, and menhaden, which are bait fish and also used to make fish meal. Then among the diadromous fishes, the migratory fishes, we have blueback herring, which you see pictured here, alewife, and American eel. So let's talk a little bit more about the diadromous fishes. In addition to the freshwater and estuarine fishes, there are diadromous fishes. And the two lifestyles that we have in the Darby Creek are anadromous and catadromous fishes. So an anadromous fish for example, shad, are born in fresh water, they migrate to the sea to mature, and return to freshwater habitats to spawn, which is what the word for reproducing. Examples of anadromous fishes are salmon and many species in the herring family, as I said, for example, the, the shad. Then we also have catadromous fishes. Catadromous fishes are born at sea, migrate into fresh water to mature, and then return to sea to spawn. The only major example of this migration pattern in, in our vicinity, because this migration pattern is more typically found in tropical climates, is the American eel. The reason that this is a more tropical pattern is because tropical seas often have less food in them for very tiny fishes than the freshwater habitats. So the fish are migrating to where the food is most abundant for them when they're young. 
Dams impede the migration of both types of fishes to up and down rivers and creeks, preventing them from reaching their breeding grounds, whether that's in freshwater or at sea. There were three dams removed from the Lower Darby Creek in 2012. Some dams still remain. But I'd like to show you an example of one of those creeks that was removed. And that is the dam at Kent Park in Darby Creek, Pennsylvania. Uh, pardon me, in, Delaware, in uh, Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania. This was a boulder dam and it was removed in 2012. The dam was breached, meaning broken, as you can see in the foreground. So the flow over that part of this boulder dam was really dangerous. And if anyone had walked across the dam, you can imagine um, teenagers might like to do that. It would, the flow would have been very dangerous. Dam removal is beneficial to the fish migration and to movement in this case. I, I also think this one was probably um, a good idea for the safety of the public. When the dam was removed by Princeton Hydro, and this project was um, overseen by American Rivers, you can see that they removed the dam where the big white arrow is, and then they restored the bank on the left. They were putting, in this picture, they were putting coconut fiber cloth over the bank because it was really steep to prevent erosion. And after they covered the bank with the coconut fiber, then other people came back and put live willow stakes in the bank. And the bank is so thoroughly vegetated now that you would never even know that it has that, that stair step or amphitheater effect. The, uh, that restoration worked really nicely. So turning now to some of the really interesting fishes that live in the Darby Creek watershed, I have several examples that I would like to, to tell you about. We do have smallmouth and largemouth bass in the Darby Creek watershed, and I'd like to focus on the largemouth bass for a few minutes. This is an issue that deserves our attention. Awanowitz et al. in 2016 did a study of largemouth and, and smallmouth basses in nas national wildlife refuges in the United States. And they reported that 20% of male largemouth bass sampled at the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge have oocytes in their testes. So what this means is that male fish in their testes had oocytes, meaning eggs. And normally a male should have few or no eggs in the testis should only be a place for the creation of sperm. This is called an intersex condition, and the intersex, con intersex condition has been observed in bass at other national wildlife refuge. So what could be causing this? At other places, the cause is believed to be runoff from animal feeding operations and from crops where the chemicals used have endocrine disrupting effects. An endocrine disrupting effect means that the chemical behaves as if it was a hormone, behaves as if it was estrogen or testosterone or another hormone. So in some places the effect is from animal feeding operations and crops or it can be from water release from wastewater treatment plants or combined sewer outfalls containing pharmaceutical products with endocrine disrupting effects. We, we know, because it's been studied by the US Geological Survey, that there are very small levels of a lot of pharmaceutical products in the waters of Pennsylvania. Our wastewater treatment plants are not equipped to, to remove those chemicals. The levels are not to considered to be dangerous to humans at this time, but it is believed that, it may be, that they may be causing the intersex condition in the fishes. Things like Benadryl, antidepressants, birth control pills, so that would be estrogen, um, Tylenol, caffeine, have all, have all been measured in Pennsylvania waterways. So like I said, this is an issue that deserves our attention. It may cause the decreased reproductive productivity in the fishes in the Darby Creek watershed that have been reported elsewhere. 
Bundarus hutter clitus is another native of the Darby Creek watershed. Bundarus hutter clitus has many unique features. The common name of this fish is the mummy chog, and they're capable of living in purely fresh water or purely salt water. You think about taking a goldfish in his little goldfish bowl to the beach and throwing him in a bucket of ocean water, you're pretty sure that that goldfish wouldn't last very long. But you can take a mummy chog and put it in a bucket of fresh water and switch it to a bucket of salt water and back to fresh again, and it'll do just fine. Mummy chogs uh, are found from Nova Scotia to the northeast coast of Florida. They are most frequently found in salt marshes and other estuarine environments. If you're a fisher person, they are the familiar bait fish that you would buy at the Jersey Shore or might catch yourself in a minnow trap. In the Darby Creek, Fundos heteroclitus is found in purely fresh water in the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge and also in the Muckinapetus Creek. Granted, the conductivity is a little higher in that water, but it's certainly not salt water. And the Fungils heteroclitus probably live in other tributaries of the Darby as well, but I, I have not looked. Interestingly, Fungils heteroclitus is found in Glen Olden above a dam. The dam is at the intersection of East Amos Land Road and Delmar Drive in Norwood, if you're familiar with that area. So the Fungils heteroclitus are found above the dam, and the dam is very high. So, how did they get up there? That dam has been there for a couple of hundred years. It was a mill dam. So that population has either been there prior to the building of the, since prior to the building of the dam, or they could be bait bucket releases because this fish does get released by fishermen if they're not going to use um, all, of the, all of the bait fish that they caught. Another interesting feature about fungus heteroclitus was discovered by my colleague, Robert Dolly at Ursinus College. In Nova Scotia, at the northern part of their range, Fundulus heteroclitus has been shown to hybridize with a relative, which is called Fundulus diaphanus, where they live together at brackish water sites. These two species usually do not live together, so it may be that mistakes are made in choosing mates, resulting in the hybrids. So a hybrid is a cross between two different kinds of animals. What's unique about these hybrids is that they're all females and that they're all genetically identical to each other. Absolutely genetically identical. Unlike normal fish or people where you would have a, a variety within the species. So here's how it works in these hybrids. You look at the illustration, what I have drawn on the, what I have pictured on the left is a male of fungalus heteroclitus, and on the right, a female of fungalus diaphanous. We have 46 chromosomes. These fish have 50, so the sperm has half the number of chromosomes and the egg has half the number of chromosomes. So when you put them together, the normal chromosome number is reconstituted. So the fungus heteroclitus sperm has 25 chromosomes and the egg from fungalus diaphanous has 25 chromosomes. When those two fish make a mistake and mate, you come up with a hybrid, which has the normal chromosome number of 50. But something about this unusual organism, this hybrid, makes it create eggs which have all 50 chromosomes. It's as if the chromosomes get confused and just skip the step where they're supposed to cut the chromosome number in half. So these all-female hybrids make offspring which have all 50 chromosomes that are found in their mother, their sisters, their cousins, their grandmothers, and all their descendants. You could actually graft a fish from one individual to another and it would take. Transplants would otherwise recover, require the same immunosuppressive drugs that a human has to have when they get an organ transplant from a different person to prevent the rejection. But if you grafted a fin from one of these fish to another, the fin would take because they're all genetically identical. 
So there's even more about this species that makes them very unique. And this is a completely different story. Pollution resistance has evolved in fundulus heterocolitis in Massachusetts and elsewhere. This work has been done, beautifully done, by uh, Dr. Whitehead and Dr. Hahn. And what they have discovered is that resistant fish from very polluted areas can survive in high quality quantities of chemical pollution exposure in the laboratory. Whereas individuals from a relatively unpolluted area develop a lethal heart defect during early development if exposed to the same amount of pollution. My lab is examining whether this is also occurring in the Darby Creek. So in other words, where these fish live in very, very polluted areas, they have evolved a way to resist having this heart defect. If you take those fish and you put them in the laboratory and expose them to high quantities of pollution in the laboratory, they'll be fine. But if you expose the individuals from relatively unpolluted populations to the same amount of pollution in the laboratory, they'll develop a lethal heart defect. The children and grandchildren of the resistant fish are also resistant, showing that this is a heritable trait. It's not just as if an individual fish somehow got used to pollution. One mechanism of resistance that's been discovered is that the resistant individuals have a huge deletion, a huge missing part of the gene that encodes the protein that lets the pollution into the cells. We actually have the same protein. When that deletion occurs, no, none of the protein is made, so the pollution can enter the cells, and thus the fish do not have a heart defect. So again, this is one of the mechanisms of resistance that's been discovered in these fish. So to make the story even more interesting, we can take it a step further. There's a related species of fish called Fungulus grandis that lives in Texas. Fungulus grandis has received the resistant version of the gene from Fungulus heteroclitus by hybridizing with Fungulus heteroclitus in Galveston Harbor, Texas. Galveston Harbor is very polluted. So again, by hybridizing with Fungulus grandis, Fungulus heteroclitus has given them the resistant version of the gene and the Fungulus grandis are resistant. Texas is outside of the range of Fungulus heteroclitus, so the pollution resistant, pollution resistant individuals may have been bait bucket releases. And I'm happy to answer any questions about these really interesting stories at the end. I'd like to turn now to a different fish that lives in the Darby Creek watershed. And this one really deserves our respect. That's the American eel. American eel is born in the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean around Bermuda. And remember, it's a catadromous fish. So that means it migrates from the ocean into fresh water to grow. They grow for many years, and the adults are silver colored. Then they return to the Sargasso Sea to mate and die. Imagine the journey. So they are swimming west from the Sargasso Sea to the east coast of North America. And for an eel that lives in the Darby Creek and its tributaries, they have to migrate up the Delaware Bay, under ships, past the Ridley Marina, through the Heinz Refuge, through Springfield, Upper Darby, and Broomall to the smallest tributaries in the upper watershed to grow for years. I was really surprised one day when I discovered one in the creek that is right in my front yard in Berwyn. So after they grow for many years, they return on that long journey back to the Sargasso Sea to spawn and die. This shows the life cycle of the eel. Notice on the right, we have the oceanic phase and on the left, the continental phase. So if we look at the eggs in the picture at about two o'clock, those eggs are, are produced in the Sargasso Sea. And when they hatch, 
the babies are called leptocephalus larva, and they look like a piece of scotch tape with black eyes. Then they grow a little larger and become glass eels, and then elvers, and then the yellow eel, which is really a green color. You may have caught them if you've ever gone fishing at the shore. Notice that we're over on the continental phase now. And then they may spend 10 years growing to uh, a large size, two or three feet long, and it, they're silver or gray color. They, they do a little bit better with dams than a lot of the other fishes because eels can slither across the grass, particularly if it's, or particularly if it's wet. So they can get around dams a little bit better. Uh, these are a very common fish in the Darby Creek watershed. And again, they deserve our respect for such a long journey. Another of our fishes is the tessellated darter. It's another interesting species in the Darby Creek watershed. They have been shown to be host for a freshwater mussel called the dwarf wedge mussel. This is a freshwater mussel on the endangered species list. The tessellated darter lives in the Darby Creek. The, the mussel does not, but it's such an interesting story, I wanted to share it with you. The dwarf wedge mussel has a very short lifespan for a mussel. It lives about 12 years and it has relatively low fecundity, which means it doesn't have very many offspring. And that makes it particularly vulnerable. There are ongoing mussel restoration projects in the, in the Delaware River watershed. You can see what the dwarf wedge, wedge mussel looks like, and you can also see on the right a map of where they belong, or pardon me, where they are found. I'd like to speak with you a little bit about freshwater mussels, their relationship with fish, and the threats to their survival. Some species of freshwater mussel, including the dwarf wedge mussel, lure fish to them with modifications of the mussel mantle that look like prey fish. Mantle is uh, part of the mussel's soft tissues, part of its body. When attacked by the fish trying to eat the prey fish mimic, the female mussel releases her young, which are called glochidia, and they attach to the fish's gills or fins. They are very, very tiny. They look like little clams and they, they snap right onto the gills or fins of the fish. The young remain on the fish for weeks or months. So the mussels are thus dispersed by the fish host. The young undergo metamorphosis and drop to the stream bed. So they are using, so the mussels are using the fish as a means of dispersal. Mussels like their fish hosts are prevented from moving up and down waterways by dams. Mussels are also harmed by excessive sedimentation and pollution. And they are animals which are a really important part of the freshwater ecosystem. They are filter feeders that feed on detritus and plankton and particulate organic matter, so small pieces of broken up decomposing plants and animals. Depends on the species of mussel, what exactly they're filtering from the water and eating. But they are beneficial in that they're filtering the water and making it clearer and cleaner while they're feeding. Their shells were used for buttons in past centuries. They make pearls. And their shells are used as the seed for cultured oyster pearls. They're so interesting that I would invite you to go to this link for videos and for more information about the freshwater mussels. And you can see examples of how the mantle can be modified to look just like a fish or a worm. It's just amazing what has evolved. And if you also go to the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary website, you can see information about the freshwater mussel restoration projects that are ongoing in the Delaware River watershed. The last fish that I'd like to tell you about, another native of our watershed, is the bluegill sunfish. In this photograph, you see a picture of a male bluegill over the nest that he's created. They make a crater uh, on the bottom. 
they clear it out and they can add stones to it or other decorations. And the nicer nests they make, the more attractive they are to the females. But they have a very interesting reproductive strategy. If you look at the illustration on the right from Partridge et al, you'll see that there are males and females, but there are three kinds of males. On the top right, you see a parental male. And then a little over to the left, you see sneaker and satellite males. The parental males mature to full size, they build nests, they mate with females, and they care for the young. The sneaker males are small and they sneak in unnoticed and fertilize eggs as a female mates with a parental male on the parental male's nest. Sneakers grow to be satellite males, which are female mimics. They join mating pairs and fertilize eggs on the nest. So in other words, when a male and female are mating, the very small sneaker males go unnoticed, but the satellite males are female mimics. And so the male whose nest it is thinks that he's mating with two females at the same time. But in fact, the sneaker and satellite males are fertilizing the eggs and the parental male is ending up raising the offspring of the sneaker and satellite males. These interesting behaviors were first reported by Gross and Sharnoff in 1980. And the illustration that I included is from Partridge et al. in 2016. The different strategies, the parental male versus the sneaker and satellite male, have been shown in part to be heritable, meaning that a sneaker male is likely to have sneaker sons. In this picture, you can see a parental male in the center and a female just um, a little bit closer to you in, this, in the slide. And a sneaker male, you can see that it's smaller in the foreground. And then the satellite male female mimic over about nine or 10 o'clock in the uh, picture. So given that we have all of these really interesting fish in our watershed, what can we do to help our fish communities? One thing that we can do is support the removal of dams that impede fish movement and migration. We can encourage the planting of riparian buffers, which are lines of trees and bushes and grasses along either side of a stream. And the wider they are, the better, because they prevent pesticides and herbicides from running into the creek from lawns. Pesticides and herbicides can be directly toxic to fish or toxic to the invertebrates that they eat. Even fertilizer can be a problem because it encourages the growth of plants and algae that can choke waterways. If we encourage the planting of riparian buffers in our community, they also keep sediments from running into the creek. Sediments smother the rocky habitat, the eggs and the nests of fish, and also the invertebrates that are eaten by the fish. Sediments also heat the creek by making the water darker, just like wearing a dark sweater on a summer afternoon. Whereas the shade of a riparian buffer cools the water and allows more oxygen to be dissolved in the water for the fish to breathe. Water holds more oxygen when it's cooler. We can also encourage stream restoration and stream bank restoration. One way to restore streams is to daylight them, which means to allow them to see the sun again. And this is done by removing streams from underground pipes in which they may have been channeled or concrete channels, rec recreating the natural environment. We can also restore streams by putting in riparian buffers, mud sills, which is a sort of, of um, wooden fish habitat, and also by adding rocks and logs to add to the habitat. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing a bit about the fishes of Darby Creek, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you.
I apologize. Um, I was muted there for a minute. Um, Kate, um, we do have one question and they want to know if there are any local examples of daylighting. Um, I don't know if Darren is on the call or not. I don't know if you have any of that information. Um, I, I don't know of any local examples of daylighting. Um, I don't know if Robin might. She's uh, trying to ask a question. question. <laughs> or, or maybe um, Lauren. I'm not sure if Lauren's on. I do know that Darren right now um, is working on a section in Havertown that he wants to daylight. Um, but I do believe that it's going to be a little bit further down the road um, until that actually gets um, really what, you know, on the ground type of work done. Uh, we do have another question from, uh, from Rick Flounders. Uh, what type of native fish would do well in small backyard ponds? Hi, Rick. Uh, sunfish are incredibly resilient and they would probably do fine in a backwater pond, in a, pardon me, in a backyard pond. You would want to be careful that um, if you did collect them that you uh, don't re-release them in case they've gotten any diseases or parasites from something else that you might have had living in there. Um, so uh, I that would be one thing that I would just caution you about. Okay, we have another question. Um, Kate, did you say that the chemicals are found in Darby Creek watershed? the ones that result in genetic changes in smallmouth bass? Um, now, that's a good question, Mary. I don't remember whether Awanowitz at all measured, actually measured the level of the chemicals uh, in the water. I forget whether they actually did, did that analysis. Um, I do know that the U.S. Geological Survey has measured all of those chemicals in Pennsylvania. But given that you see these intersex fish at 20% of the males, in 20% of the males, whereas the background level is believed to be a very small percent in this species, that, um, that it's probably, that that intersex condition is probably due to the chemicals that are in our watershed. Um, I just shared my screen and I no longer can read questions. So give me a second while I try and figure this one out. Uh, David, could you take over um, reading the questions because I shared my screen and now I don't have the chat box. Oh yeah, sh sure Sue. Um, so next question is another one from Rick Flounders, do either small or largemouth bass do okay in small ponds? I know largemouth certainly do, but Kate, take it over and expand. Yeah, largemouth bass do, David is right. Um, but I, I wouldn't think a, a little, not a tiny pond. How big is your pond, uh, Mr. Flounders? Let's see, 100 square feet, so pretty tiny. Mm, I think you might want to stick with, you might want to stick with little sunfish. As long as the pond's deep enough that it doesn't freeze in the winter. My, my, background, my backyard pond um, is a small plastic pond. I would say it's about the size of a, of a bathtub and I have tadpoles in there, which I'm raising, trying to prevent them from being eaten um, by the the uh, snapping turtles and the and the largemouth bass in our larger pond. Um, and I've also found that background backyard pond to be a really marvelous place for invertebrates. There are damselflies laying eggs in there, and there are um, um, scuds living in there. So it's a great place for, um, it's a great place for invertebrates in a little background, little backyard pond. 
Great information, Kate. Um, so the next question is from Robin. How, how big of a problem is the release of carp from backyard ponds? And I assume she's meaning koi as well and goldfish and stuff like that. Um, in, in, my, in my experience, I've only seen goldfish at one place, or pardon me, two places in, in our watershed. So I personally have not seen that it's a big problem. I don't know of anyone who's actually researched that in our, in our watershed. Okay, um, next question is, in our freshwater streams, and it's from Tim Devaney, uh, in our freshwater streams, what is the level of highway salt runoff that starts to hurt freshwater fish? It would, it would depend on the type of fish, Tim. I don't know um, the exact level. Um, I do know that we have pretty high levels of, of salt in, our Dar in the Darby Creek watershed. Sue, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Um, I don't know the actual numbers. Um, we are going to be doing some studying, um, some monitoring and studies on that, um, coming up with our monitoring program. Um, but sorry, I don't know the actual levels. Yeah, right and, and that, that is certainly going to depend on the fish. Um, you know, the, there, there's definitely levels of uh, salt that affect bug, different bugs, um, different fish, and there's certainly data that support um, certain levels that are acutely toxic and, and then chronically toxic. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, one of the lowest levels of kind of chronic, or one of the lower levels of chronic influence of, of uh, chloride, that is the, you know, chloride as part of sodium chloride, normal rock salt, um, is about 300 milligrams per liter of chloride, which translates to about a conductivity level of about 1200 micro siemens per centimeter. Um, and interestingly, that's a little bit higher than the level that the Philadelphia Water Department likes to maintain the water of the Delaware River. They released, they released water from reservoirs in the upper Delaware River watershed to keep pushing this, to push the salt line down past Chester. Um, I also know that on one of our monitoring sites down in the upper Darby area, that one storm, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, um, because of the amount of salt that the municipality used, that it actually reached, um, the water was saltier than ocean water and salt, regular salt, ocean water. So uh, pretty much um, just whatever, right in that one area, it pretty much killed everything. There are definite salt problems and salt not only is a stressor itself, but pretty much in areas where you see a conductivity, high conductivity, high salt is, it's also just kind of an indicator of other pollutants. So when there's salt coming in, when there's high conductivity, it's kind of an indicator of that there's going to be other pollutants coming in as well. Um, so next question here is from Stephen Lockhart. How far up the Derby may shad be found? Um, I'm, I honestly haven't studied that in the Derby myself. I know that I can find them in the Muckinapetus, but only up until the dam. Um, so that's in Norwood. Let's see. Um, I honestly don't know, Steve. Rich Horowitz might know that. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Rich Horowitz is um, with the Academy of Natural Science. He's also uh, was PCBA's board member. And um, Steve, I can get you his information if you would like to talk to him about that. Um, then there's a last question here so far is, what's the general health of the population of fish in the Darby Creek watershed? I actually think that it's pretty good, uh, especially in the western and 
um, upper watershed. It's really interesting that in the John Hines uh, National Wildlife Refuge, the fish have a lot of parasites, but parasites have a um, complex life cycle. When I say parasites, I'm, I'm speaking about different kinds of, of uh, worms that live in the body. And in those parasites have a complex life cycle in which they have to live in the fish, they have to live in a vertebrate in part of their life cycle, a bird, and they have to live in a snail in part of their life cycle. So if none of those, if one of those three hosts is missing, then the parasites can't complete their life cycle. The birds are um, usually herons and egrets or um, kingfishers. And so where those birds exist, then the, the, and also the snails and the fish, the parasites can exist. So one would think a parasite's a bad thing, it's a disease, but in fact, it's an indicator of the complexity of life and the richness of the ecosystem that the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge provides, that the fish there do have a lot of parasites. They're just part of the complex ecosystem. So um, although the fish are exposed to more and more pollution, the lower they get in the watershed, there is a pretty rich community in the, the Heinz Refuge because the refuge is there, which is a wonderful thing. So, and again, overall, because we have different kinds of habitats, the freshwater, the estuarine, and some of those, the mummy chug being really a, a, a pretty salty saltwater fish, um, we do have a pretty nice diversity of fish in the watershed. Great. Um, okay, here's another question that's come in from Mary Westervelt. How large are the eels that we might find in the upper reaches of the Darby? Two or three feet long. <laughs> Quick, simple answer. <laughs> um, no, silver colored, by the way. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's see here, another question from audio. Has there been much research about the, about the location finding capacity of migratory fish? So the ability of migratory fish to find specific locations, I guess is what she's meaning, or he. Uh, yes, some fish are very, and there's been a tremendous amount of research on that. Some fish are very uh, loyal to their the river in which they were born and and you probably know about that in the case of salmon but the american eel very interestingly has been studied by john avis who's a famous fish geneticist at the university of georgia and what dr avis has shown is that out there in the sargasso sea there are the american eels and also the european eels and the question he was asking was do the fish know which way to go? Do they know to swim west or east? And are they seeking a particular stream? So what he found was that you can genetically differentiate the American eels from the European eels, and it does seem that the genetics supports the behavioral studies that show that the European eels are in instinctively know or genetically programmed to swim east back to Europe, and the American eels are genetically programmed to swim west back to North America, but they do not have fidelity to a particular stream. So the eels that come from the Darby Creek, their children would not seek out the Darby Creek. They would just be seeking out some part of the American East Coast. Very interesting. Um, Kate, I had a question myself regarding the, um, you know, the pharmaceuticals question on OO sites. Is there, is there any, um, have you seen anything with regard to just, um, you know, how old the fish are with regard to increased, um, you know, vulnerability to, to that, that type of effect? 
You mean the age of exposure, or do you mean do yeah, they basically. make more and more eggs as they get older? Well, I guess either, just like basically just being exposed, you know, an older fish has been exposed for more years to presumably to those types of, you know, estrogens and whatever else. Uh, I think that I think that I have read that there really isn't an effect with age, but I also know that in a study where brown trout were, and this is published in PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that if they're exposed to um, estrogen-like hormones, the kind of estrogen-like hormones, endocrine-disrupting hormones that are um, that we do find in the environment and also are found in some plastics, that if you expose the fathers, then the offspring will have broken chromosomes, pieces broken off. That you can actually look at the chromosomes under the microscope and see that they're broken. And so that causes uh, the, the death of the offspring. So it can be exposure of the parents that affects the offspring. Very interesting. And this is pretty well documented in the in the Potomac watershed and in the Susquehanna watershed as well. Okay. Well, um, we looks like we are through with questions. Um, we're at twelve fifty two. So, Sue, do you want to wrap things up? Um, I would like to thank everyone that was able to attend. We will have this on video and you can find that um, either later this week at dcba.org on our citizen science page. Um, please feel free to look at our website, find out all the activities, sign up for our other events that are coming up. We're also going to be looking for monitoring volunteers um, to help us monitor throughout our watershed. And if you're interested in that, um, you can find my email address at dcva.org also. And um, if you have any other questions for me, for Kate, or for David, you can either email uh, David at Stroud or you can email me and I will pass your uh, question on over to Kate. Um, so if there's not any other questions, so I'd like to thank you and enjoy your day.